All right, we'll continue our study of the electric field. Hopefully, after the past couple videos, you might become convinced that if you can find the electric field, it is easy to determine the force on a charged particle. Now, what happens if you don't have just one point charge, but you have a couple? Let's say that you have Q1 here. Maybe Q1 happens to be plus 2 nanocoulombs. And then over here, you have another charge. Maybe that Q2 happens to be a minus 3 nanocoulombs. And maybe even there's another charge up here, Q3, and that's 2 nanocoulombs. And you now want to calculate the electric field at some point right here, x. Well, it turns out that like the fact that the electric field is based upon the definition of force, and the way we handle forces was we simply vectorially added them. This is called the law of superposition. So because forces obey the law of superposition, electric fields obey it, and the calculations are exactly the same sort. You're simply going to find the field due to this charge. So let's say in this case it'll be pushing over this away. I'll call that the electric field number two due to the second charge. The electric field due to this charge, which is going to be pointing up like this, that's electric field one, and the electric field due to this charge here, which is pointing over here. I'll call that, I should call that E2, and the other one here, that should be E3. And we find those three vectors, we break their vectors into X and Y parts, and we sum them up as we do any other vector. Now we could sum them with a ruler and a protractor, but we've found it's much easier to break vectors into components and use trig. Hopefully you remember that from earlier in the course. So the statement is simply this. The total electric field is simply the sum of the individual electric fields created by any set of charges. Now the way people write that in mathematics is they write the sum from I equal 1 to how many ever you have, which is called N, of the electric field I. So it becomes I1, then plus, that's what that sigma seems, that sum means plus. Let I go to 2, so you get 2, then add I going to 3, and you continue that all the way till you get to the nth. But the key thing is, it's got to be added like vectors. They're not scalars. They're not numbers. You've got to use vector math. Now, for a set of point charges, they'll often write a formula, which I don't find to be very helpful at this level, but because it's often in books, I'll put it down. They'll say that the electric field is equal to the sum from I equal 1 to N of k q i over r i squared r i hat. And the reason I don't find that very useful, these change, this changes, and you can see that in the picture above. In the picture of above, the distance from a charge to the x can be different. This is actually shorter than this distance. So that's not a constant. It can't come outside the sum. You have to find it every time. Likewise, the direction. Well, the direction depends on the direction of this line. And that changes. That's why they point in different ways. So that's not a constant either. And the charge on all three of them, that's not constant. The k, you can pull outside. But everything else is inside. The real way to work these problems, although this is very nice compact way to write it in a book. is simply work multiple problems of the one charge before. Solve each electric field. Draw it on a free body diagram. Except this time it's electric field body diagrams instead of forces. Put them in each one on, break them into their parts, and add them up. So I know this is in a lot of books. And yes, it's a very compact form, but it turns out I don't think very useful for students at the even freshman or sophomore level. All right, let's do an example. 
This is one of these things where writing a lot of formulas is not usually as helpful as working a problem. Let's start with just two. Two charges. I'm looking at point P. This charge here applies a force like this on a positive charge. So that would be the direction of electric field. And I'm going to call this charge 1. So that's electric field 1. I'm going to call this 2. Likewise, this other one would produce an electric field. And it would go in this direction. And it would be E2. And we can see that we could draw a little axis here. X and Y. This angle is 60 degrees. I'm sorry, not 60 degrees, my fault. This angle here, that's a 1, that's a 1. This angle is 45 degrees. So that angle there is 45 degrees. So this angle here is 45 degrees. Likewise, because this is an isosceles triangle, 1 meter by 1 meter, this angle here is 45 degrees. And that makes this angle 45 degrees. Now, all I need to do is find the length of these electric fields. That is their magnitudes. And then I can break them into components. I can find the length of either one of them and it turned out to be the same. E2 is equal to E1 in this case. And it's 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per coulomb squared times the charge. The charge is 2 coulombs divided by the distance. Now, the distance, whether you call it R2 or R1, is the same. Notice we want the square of the distance. That's the square of the hypotenuse. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. So this is 1 meter squared plus 1 meter squared. So let me put that in your notes. This is the square of the hypotenuse. Often you have the sides and it's easier to do it in this form. So we're talking about this side of the triangle and we already know that side and this side okay now we punch that into a calculator one squared is one and one is two two cancels the two up there and so the magnitude All of which of this could be going down into here. The magnitude of E1 equal E2 is 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per, I'm sorry, Newton per coulomb. And then meters here cancels that meter squared, and that coulomb cancels one of those coulombs. All right, so now we have the magnitude. Now that we have the magnitude, I can find the y and the x components. I've already drawn my diagram here, so see above. And for part three, I want to break all field electric fields into components. So E1x is simply E1 times the sine of 45 degrees. Let's make sure we go back and show you how I get that. I get that by saying here's E1. I'm looking for the X part. That's the opposite side. And if I punch, it, going to punch calculator here. 9 second E to 9 times cosine or sine, I'm sorry, of 45. And I get 6.36 times 10 to the 9th Newton per Coulomb. Should make sure that I'm in the correct mode. Yes, I am. Okay. Now, 
it turns out I can do E2x. E2 is minus E2 sine of 45 degrees. And when I do that, I get a minus 6.36 times 10 to the ninth newtons per coulomb. E1y is E1 cosine of 45 degrees. And it turns out that's 6.36 times 10 to the ninth newtons per coulomb. And E2y is E2 cosine 45 degrees. And it's also 6.36 times 10 to the 9 newtons per coulomb. The total electric field in the X is E1X plus E2X. And when you do that, you get 0 newtons per coulomb. And then you have to do the Y components. EY is E1Y plus E2Y. And when I do that, I get 1.27 times 10 to the 10th Newton per Coulomb. All right. So if you want to find the magnitude and the angle, in this case, it's very simple. You're just going to find, well, I might go ahead and write the vector. Let's go ahead and write it in Cartesian form because maybe they'd be happy with that. And that's all they ask. If all they ask to do is Cartesian form, it's 0 newtons per coulomb i hat plus 1.27 10 to the 10 newtons per coulomb j hat. And since the x component is 0, you could just write 1.27 10 to the 10 newton per coulomb j hat. Now in this case, to find it in polar form, is really simple because it lies along one axis. You would take your vector and draw it. Here it is. 1.27 times 10 to the 10th newtons per coulomb. So if you want me to write that in polar form, the electric field is 1.27 times 10 to the 10th newton per coulomb. Now you want the angle. The angle is measured with respect to the positive x-axis. That's 90 degrees. So add an angle of 90 degrees, depending on what the question asks you. Okay. Really, all this stuff here, this is trig. We've been doing trig for a long time. That's not anything new. And we've been adding vectors and components for a long time. The only thing that's new is calculating the length of these E's. And to calculate the length of those E's, you need the original formula for the point charge, which I told you to memorize. So make sure you memorize that. All the rest is just the same as the way you handle forces, except now they're force per charge, called electric field vectors instead of force vectors. All right, we'll see you on another video.